can uh, lead to uh, a wide array of confusing results. Now, most state law, comp most state workers' compensation laws are extraterritorial. This means that an employee in the enabling state, E-N-A-B-L-I-N-G, enabling state is a term of art which means the state in which the employee was hired or under whose law he recovers benefits. In other words, that state enabled this entire claim to come to fruition because that's where the claim came from. Uh, most states, um, uh, or an employee in the enabling state who suffers an occupational injury or disease or, or um, uh, some of death while outside of its boundaries in a forum state, F-O-R-U-M, a forum state is the state in which the worker is injured and files a third party action. And in most states, that employee is still eligible for workers' compensation benefits under the laws of the enabling state. But in some circumstances, the employee injured in another state may choose to collect benefits either in the enabling state or in the forum state. One state may give an employer or its workers' compensation carrier first money rights of recovery, such as Texas, while another may disallow subrogation interest unless and until the worker is made whole. Georgia is a case in, in point. Knowing which state subrogation law to apply to these multi-state subrogation cases is critical in evaluating your subrogation potential, and it is critical in recovering your subrogation interest, sometimes at all, and sometimes it's critical in recovering uh, or maximizing the recovery of your subrogation interest. And I have a quick story before we get started uh, into the concept of extraterritorial subrogation, but the advantage that this gives us all of us who wear workers' compensation claims adjusting hats, those of us who wear workers' compensation subrogation hats, and those of us who wear both hats. Um, I have a friend who is a Marine and an optical engineer at Camp, Camp Pendleton in California. He's been in the Marines for about uh, 30 years. Among other things, he still calibrates scopes for snipers. And you know you're passionate about leadership in the military uh, when even talking about weapon calibration, you get thinking about leadership principles, and this is what my friend does. And one statement he made to me uh, recently, I was down in San Diego for uh, some depositions on a subrogation case, and it stuck with me. He said, Gary, um, just one millimeter adjustment of a screw slightly bigger than a pinhead can cause the, the firer of the sniper rifle to miss their target by more than two meters when firing from the common distance of one kilometer. Such a small change made in the wrong direction can have catastrophic consequences. So that got me to thinking how we could apply that concept to extraterritorial subrogation with workers' compensation. Um, every leader must master three aspects of visionary sight. Number one is hindsight. Okay, we all learn through hindsight. This is the ability to reflect and learn from the past. We also have the vision of insight. Insight is the ability to interpret and respond to the present. And lastly, foresight, something none of us truly have, is, is the ability to predict and prepare for the future. But we can use foresight to shape the insight that we use in handling our subrogation cases. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Most subrogation professionals become good at what they do by learning from just one aspect, and that is hindsight. They never make the same mistake twice. But a far smaller number of us actually utilize two aspects, hindsight and insight. Only a few are able to utilize and master all three of these aspects, hindsight, insight, and foresight. But it is foresight that gives workers' compensation subrogation professionals a real advantage over those who are out there to destroy our subrogation interests and liens, especially in multi-subrogation, multi-state subrogation scenarios. By the time we're done with this webinar, my hope is that we all begin to implement foresight from the moment a first report of injury is received, or for you subrogation professionals, from the moment you receive that claim, that file, from the claims handler because foresight is what gives us the advantage to maximize our subrogation recoveries. But what exactly is extraterritorial subrogation? 
Well, when faced with paying a worker's compensation claim that occurs in another state, for example, uh, a Texas insurer who is handling a worker's compensation claim for a Texas employee injured in some other state, let's say New, New Hampshire, New Jersey, it may be faced with a third-party lawsuit filed in, say, New Jersey, applying New Jersey law. The only problem with this is because the insurer is paid benefits under Texas law, the insurer should be entitled to subrogate pursuant to Texas law. After all, that's the game. Those are the rules by which it is playing. It's paying, paying benefits under the Texas statute. It should be entitled to recover benefits under that same statute. And this is where I've always said workers' compensation is like a square hole in a round peg. It really does not fit in with our current system of civil justice in America. But we are stuck with it for the time being, and it's a good system. It's a system that, that we, we've relied on for over 100 years now. Um, New Jersey workers' compensation law is more restrictive and less favorable for the character, uh, character for the carrier. But, uh, and, and, and New Jersey law judges have been very lethargic and slow to apply the workers' compensation laws of other states. So when a worker of an enabling state is injured in the forum state, again, the enabling state would be Texas, because that's where the benefits were paid. The forum state is New Jersey, because that's where the forum is located. That's where the lawsuit is pending. It is often the case that the law of the enabling state Texas and the law of the forum state are diametrically opposed. That's where extraterritorial subrogation comes in. It's any effort to subrogate outside the boundaries of the state where the benefits are being paid. Now, this is a lot more common than it was uh, two or three decades ago because of our economy and the things we've just discussed. It involves concepts of federalism, which is, of course, a national government uh, within which individual sovereign states operate. So state sovereignty comes into play. So extraterritorial extra subrogation is a complicated subject because it invokes constitutional laws in some cases. We'll touch on this a little later on. But we are primarily concerned with, and this is the one question we want to ask the moment we get this case, this is to give us that foresight, which state subrogation laws apply? The enabling states? the forum states, or possibly some other state. Now, workers' compensation claims involving multiple states, um, you have a number of issues to be considered. And what I always do is I always recommend that when faced with multi-state workers' comp situations, you do what I do. And I do this, and I've been doing it for 30 years, even today. And I will undoubtedly have one of these claims to review, analyze, give an opinion on, or handle today. Um, and I write down on a separate, p clean piece of paper all of the variables. <clears throat> Where was the claimant hired? And you'll see why these become relevant as we move on. Where will the claimant file the claim, or where has the claimant filed the claim? Under which state's laws? Where was the claimant injured? Very important, but doesn't also doesn't always dictate where the claimant will file suit. Where is the employer principally located? Where is the third party lawsuit filed? And where is the tortfeasor located? If a corporate defendant, where is its primary place of business, its home office? These are all variables that we have to consider when dealing with extraterritorial subrogation. Now, before we get involved with how to get this foresight that will literally make the difference between a full recovery, even in a large, catastrophic lost workers' compensation subrogation case, and no recovery at all, um, before we get to that, and we will get to it, and we'll hopefully work through how you can calculate um, the foresight that you'll need to make decisions which will affect you dramatically when it comes time for you to get a check back, representing reimbursement for you or your insured. Um, we have to look at some of the laws that deal with where a worker chooses to file a worker's compensation claim, because everything starts with the employee. Employee hires attorney, looks in the TV guide, finds a worker's compensation lawyer. He's like the player in a chess game. Uh, I enjoy chess, and I've been playing since I was a kid. But the player with the white pieces in the game of chess moves first. He decides 
um, the employee decides where he or she will file their claim. Where he plays his first move, just like in chess, determines the best opening move for black. Pawn to king four for the white. Um, a lot of times you won't want to play pawn to queen four. I mean, that is an opening, but for many it's not as good an opening as pawn to king four. Um, and pawn to queen four opening for white, you don't want to respond with pawn to king four because then you, your pawn will be taken and you'll be down a pawn. So what the employee does usually is very um, significant. And the employee usually picks the state with the most generous benefits. But that can come back to haunt him because unlike you who have attended this webinar and will have the benefit of foresight, 95% of the time, in my experience, the employee and his attorney, Mr. Experienced TV Guide, workers' compensation attorney, trial lawyer, who takes this workers' compensation case oftentimes simply because he wants the third party action, will not give a lot of considered thought to how his choice of state to pay benefits will affect our subrogation rights. And that's to our advantage, because we will be thinking about it. Under the United States Constitution, each state is still considered sovereign, and each state controls the laws within its boundaries. Now, the laws of many states contain legislation, laws with regard to which state's work comp benefits will apply when an employee of one state is injured in another state. So another reason why this is so complicated is there isn't just one body of law to understand. There's 51 bodies of law, including the District of Columbia. Many states will allow a worker injured out of state to apply for benefits under their state if they have significant contacts with the facts or dynamics of a particular work-related compensable injury. Other states will um, usually set forth in their statute the terms and conditions under which benefits from that enabling state are allowed. Um, some states enact laws which allow an employee to agree in writing with the employer on the principal location of the employment specifically so that extraterritorial segregation issues are more easily resolved. And um, I use Texas as an example. I could use any state, but I'll just use Texas because they have a very ordered and, and unconfusing Texas labor code. And under um, section 406071, uh, the employee is allowed to bring a claim in Texas um, if the injury is compensable, uh, if it occurred in Texas, and the claimant has significant contacts with, with Texas, or the employment is principally located in Texas. So you have a guaranteed right to bring it in Texas, but this doesn't mean you have to. You may be able to bring it in other states, including states in which the injury occurred. Some states have reciprocal agreements. Oregon, Washington, you know, usually you have a set of seven or eight different states where in the Midwest, Illinois, um, um, Wisconsin, Minnesota, where employees generally drive back and forth over the border. And so those agreements say, OK, well, if you can file in Wisconsin, you can file in Illinois. Um, but a lot of times it's. Um, you know, the significant contacts is a, is a legislative requirement. Now, Texas defines significant contact as if an employee is hired or recruited in that state, in Texas, if the employee wasn't injured later than one year after the hire date, or the employee worked in Texas for 10 days during 12 months of the preceding the injury. Principal location is defined as the state where the employer has a place of business, where an employer works, um, or the employer resides and spends a substantial portion of working time there. So these are significant definitions that um, uh, are used within the Texas statute. Not all states define these things as nicely. So when we are discussing or teaching jurisdiction work comp in a workers' compensation class, not workers' compensation subrogation, but just basic comp adjusting, we're basically discussing coverage. In other words, which state or or federal law or other workers' compensation system applies to cover benefits due for a given work injury. Can you, you know, um, compromise it with a CSA? Can you do a dollar contract? How much? What, what are the schedule payments? How much is owed, owed for indemnity for a significant uh, permanent uh, partial loss for a loss of an arm, an eye, a limb? I mean, these are all things that each state handles differently. But the three main workers' compensation 
jurisdiction concepts are relatively easy to understand. Every worker comp adjuster and corporate risk manager probably has them memorized, um, even better than I do because my specialty is workers' compensation subrogation. Um, all states allow a claim if an injury happens within their borders. 43 states allow a claim to be filed if the employee is hired in that state. 40 states allow a claim to be filed in the state if employment is principally located within its borders and the employee is injured in another state. So these are important concepts with regard to where the employee can file for workers' compensation. And as we know, that can sometimes change. And sometimes we, as the comp carrier, have ability to steer the claimant toward one state or another. They don't know. Um, you can make a recommendation, or you simply start by paying benefits under Kentucky law as opposed to Virginia law. And then later on, if the claimant wants to change it, he can. But most often will not change it if the benefits are not any better in the other state. There's no reason to. What they're not doing is using foresight to pick a state for benefits, which will destroy your workers' compensation lien when it comes time for the third party action. Because now is where we get into the concepts of hindsight, foresight, and insight. Because you attended this webinar, hopefully, you will have, after it's completed, the insight into the subrogation strategy. And you will employ that strategy based on the foresight you develop by being familiar with your subrogation strengths and weaknesses in various states involved. So not only are you going to have to know the laws of the state with regard to which state's laws govern subrogation, okay, that's a big issue, and we'll talk about it, but you also have to know why. What are the issues that might affect your lien? Why would you choose Texas comp benefits over Georgia comp benefits, or vice versa, if you have the choice? And why you might want to steer the claimant toward one as opposed to the other? The worker usually won't consider subrogation rights when determining which state. Uh, it's very rare that one of their attorneys will be looking ahead to third-party actions and how it affects your lien. Um, they do have the ability to choose a state which limits subrogation, but as I said, about 95% of the time they don't. A couple examples, a Texas worker injured in Georgia. You're the lawyer for the claimant. Should, you, should the worker choose Georgia or Texas benefits? Well, let's take a, a few uh, a closer look. If, if he chooses Georgia benefits, the claimant has the exclusive right to file suit for one year. Okay, that's different than in Texas. Under Georgia benefits, the made whole rule is codified, and it's very difficult for us to prove, not impossible, but difficult for us to prove that the claimant has been made whole. Um, if Texas benefits are paid, we have a first money right of recovery. If Georgia benefits are paid, the plaintiff's attorney can recover costs. If Texas benefits are paid, get this, there's no subrogation rights if a third party suit is filed in Georgia. What? We'll talk about this a little later because we'll, we're going to single out Georgia because of its unique approach in this area. But you can see that which states you choose is extremely important. Um, so all states, therefore, are not created equal. So let's talk about why foresight matters. Here's some more third-party considerations. Can you recover? as a subrogated worker's compensation carrier from UM or UIM benefits? If you're in Montana, New Hampshire, North Carolina, Ohio, the answer is yes, you can. If you're in Alabama, California, Oklahoma, Oregon, and others, you, you cannot. If you're in Ar uh, Arkansas, Delaware, Nevada, Pennsylvania, um, uh, South Dakota, Texas, um, you can subrogate against UM benefits if it's the employer's policy that has the UM benefits. If it's the employee's policy, you cannot. So you can see how just from this one issue, which is a common issue, people have minimum limits, you have a sizable $50,000 lien, there's only 20, 25,000 in third party liability coverage, UM or UIM in that case is implicated. And you want to know whether or not you can recover. If you're in Alaska, for example, 
they're undecided on that issue. Um, some states, like Michigan, say you can subrogate for uninsured motorists, but not for underinsured motorists. Go figure. But, of course, all of these have a profound impact on how much money you'll get back in your third-party subrogation action. Uh, New Jersey, Vermont, they allow UM subrogation, UIM subrogation, but only if the claimant is made whole. So if you have a choice between a state that just says, yes, you can subrogate, or in one that says no, or one that says, well, only if the claimant is made whole, you'll want to have these benefits paid under the state which says yes. This is the foresight I was talking about. Medical malpractice. If you're in Alabama, Louisiana, Kansas, um, I believe Michigan, Minnesota, you are not you you can subrogate if there's a medical malpractice case, but if you're in California, Iowa, and some other states, you cannot. Huge difference. It's black and white. Yes, in in uh, Kansas, no in California. If you have a major medical malpractice case and you have a million dollars paid out, your foresight literally means the difference between recovering a million dollars and recovering zero. So you can see how important these things become. Dual capacity doctrine. These are situations where the employer also uh, coincidentally is an independent negligent entity causing the injury, such as uh, you know, Ford Motor Company. Let's say a Ford employee is driving a, his, his own car, which happens to be a Ford, and it blows up because of some defect. Well, can he sue Ford for the defective product? Well, wait a second, Ford's also his employer. Well, in that case, depending on the state, you may be able to because the employer is operating in a dual capacity. One is employer, and two as manufacturer of the automobile. Um, if you're in California, Illinois, Kansas, Kentucky, Michigan, yes, you can sue the employer if it, if it has um, a dual capacity, but if you're in Indiana, Iowa, Missouri, Montana, and a number of other states, Rhode Island, South Carolina, you cannot. So again, it makes a huge difference as to whether or not you can make a recovery. Um, construction litigation. Uh, many states have new laws which uh, declare that subcontractors, which would otherwise be good targets for subrogation actions, become statutory employers and cannot be sued. And the laws vary from state to state. <clears throat> Your statutory credit. Are you entitled to a credit at all? If you're in Connecticut, Georgia, Oregon, the answer is no. You've got to either subrogate for all of your, your lien, past and future, in the third party action, or you don't get a credit. Or is there a formula? Is a trust required? Uh, is your credit limited to like damages, as in South Dakota? Are there limits on unknown or incalculable future medical benefits, such as in Tennessee? Or uh, can you only recover your credit if the carrier prosecutes the third-party case? You see, there's, there's so many variables here that it could make your head spin, which is why it's good to have a good resource material, a reference book um, close by so that you can look at these things the moment that first claim, that first report of injury comes in. Attorney's fees on future benefits. Um, are you going to owe attorney's fees up front? Are you going to owe them if, as, and when paid? as in Illinois? Or are you going to owe them not at all? These are important considerations. If you have a million dollar lien, you're talking about the difference between recovering 666000 and a million dollars. That's a huge amount of money and the shareholders of, of your insurance company or if you're a TPA, your client, or if you're a self-insured, your shareholders are going to be very interested in because that's a lot of money. And take that, that's just one case. Take that times 10 cases. So foresight makes a big difference. Uh, can a co-employee be a third party? Some states allow co-employees to be sued um, outright, some only if they're a manager, some uh, if they're an alter ego of the employer. Uh, and it's important to know the differences and know whether or not you can sue. So these are more third party considerations that have to be taken into consideration. So now you have to look at all of the variables we talked about with regard to where was the employee hired, where did the accident happen. And remember, you wrote those down on your pad of paper. Well, draw a line, and underneath those now, you look at these considerations. And then you're going to do an informed uh, analysis as to which state you think is more beneficial. Because the question that you want to answer is, which state's subrogation law will apply to your third-party action? 
And I'm going to tell you something right now that the majority of lawyers don't even understand. Um, and it has to do with conflicts of laws. That's the body of law that, you will, that most lawyers learn about in law school but forget because it's really not applicable to the common everyday third party action that they may be involved in. But conflicts of laws is a set of procedural rules that determine which jurisdiction applies to a given legal dispute. The term is interchangeable with concepts like private international law, um, uh, international private law, but there are actually three branches of conflicts of laws. Jurisdiction, we're not talking about that. Choice of law, which we are talking about, that's determining the actual law to be applied to resolve an issue. And foreign judgments, we're not talking about that. So choice of law is a subset of conflicts of laws. So when I say choice of law, it, I'm really using it interchangeably with conflicts of laws. But choice of law is a procedural stage within litigation of a third party case which involves conflict of laws. Because as the Texas and Georgia example that I gave you, there's a conflict of law there. Texas law says, yes, work comp carrier, go get your money. You get it all back. You get first money. We want you to have it. We want your employer to, to get this money back because it helps keep down premiums and it's good for uh, the insurance industry and it's good for the economy and it holds the tort fees, fees are at, uh, responsible and it prevents a double recovery, all the normal uh, justifications for subrogation, uh, whereas Georgia does not. So the legal issues involving conflicts of law determine one question, and that is the one that you're looking at, which state's subrogation laws apply. And American courts have used a variety of approaches to determine which state's laws will apply in a situation such as these, including the three primary approaches. Um, and I've thrown a fourth in here. Uh, but the three are lex loci delicti. And actually, um, that is a... Uh, that should be lex loci delicti, that was a typo, um, D-E-L-I-C-T-I, -I, uh, literally in Latin, and I took five years of Latin for some strange reason, so I'm always very excited when I get to actually use it. But uh, lex meaning law, loci from locus, uh, ma uh, masculine noun meaning place, and delecti meaning uh, tort or wrong. The law of the place of the tort, the law of the place of the wrong, is the probably the oldest um, uh, rule, and it simply says wherever the accident happened, that state's law determines the subrogated carrier's rights. It is falling out of favor. It is the minority rule. Only 12 states currently follow it, but it's still there. Georgia, for example, follows it because they're a little archaic on most of this stuff when it comes to subrogation. No offense to you guys in Georgia. I love you guys. I've got a lot of friends down there, but your state is just a bear. Um, number two, the second rule is something called the Larson Rule. And I use it interchangeably with Restatement Section 185 of Conflicts of Laws, although they're a little different. We'll go into them in a moment. But this rule says we're going to apply the law of the enabling state. If Texas benefits are paid. Texas law governs the subrogated carrier's subrogation rights, even if the third party case is in um, you know, some other state. Um, and thirdly, most significant context is a generic conflict of laws rule, a choice of law rule, which states which haven't yet evolved to develop a workers' compensation subrogation conflicts rule, like the Larson rule, um, they follow. States which have abandoned number one, and that's dwindling, rule number one, will use number three unless they have a rule specific to workers' compensation, such as rule number two. But then number, number three, you apply the law of the state with the most significant relationship to the incident. And this is where um, this entire subject becomes somewhat subjective. I get a lot of questions. And you probably, those of you who are NAS members and see the NAS listserv, you'll see a lot of questions. Oh, I got benefits paid under Iowa law. The employee is coming from Kansas, yet he was injured in Chicago. Which, which state governs my right to file suit? Um, or which state governs my right to go against a co-employee, or which state governs my right under do I have to pay attorney's fees? Um, the answer isn't always black and white. We all love to have charts. We'd like to be able to turn to page 12 and see, well, there's the answer. Unfortunately, the most significant context is a judgment decision. It's a subjective test that judges use to determine which state has the most significant relationship. 
And each state has their own criteria to determine which state has the most significant context. So even when I answer a question to people who ask or um, uh, ask, answer a question on the listserv, it, it isn't always a black and white answer. And sometimes I have to beg off because I have to say, look, I can just take a guess. And my guess is only as good as the, the, the brain inside that judge who's going to make this call. Um, but this is now the majority rule, most significant context. Larson rule, restatement 185, we wish every state would have this rule um, be, because that would give us some leverage. But uh, the last one, which is um, different from number one, lex fori, which means the law of the forum, is very, very outdated. Um, there are really no states which, which deal with this, with lex fori across the board. Although, and I, I hate to get too, too complicated, but it is what it is, um, sometimes states will apply lex loci delicti, number one, if it is a <clears throat> rule of substantive law. And if it's a rule of procedural law, they'll apply lex fori. We'll get into that a little bit, and I know it's complicated. But most states have determined that subrogation is a substantive law. So more often than not, lex loci delicti will apply unless two, number two or three here apply. So now that you're thoroughly confused, and I apologize, but this is the, the, the hand we're dealt, let's talk about uh, rule number two, which is the Larson rule. Uh, Larson rule reads, as to third-party actions, if compensation has been paid in a foreign state and suit is brought against a third party in the state of injury, the substantive, parentheses you can put in there, workers' compensation subrogation, rights of the employee subrogated insurance carrier and the employer are ordinarily held governed by the law of the foreign state. So Arthur Larson, who died in 1993, was a law professor at Duke University. He was a lawyer, uh, ironically, at Quarles and Brady, a predecessor firm of Quarles and Brady here in Milwaukee. He was uh, Secretary of Labor under Dwight D. Eisenhower. I said died in 93. He has a publication out, a treatise called Larson's Workers' Compensation, a very, very good treatise that deals really extensively with workers' compensation, the guts of it, claims handling, benefits, you know, uh, throughout all 50 states. And it's a, it's a massive treatise. We have it here, and we have it online as well. But, and it deals tangentially with workers' compensation subrogation. But he did leave us one legacy, which was his rule, the Larson rule, which says, Workers' compensation rights are determined based on the state under which benefits are paid. And there are a lot of states that do apply that. So um, th this, is, this is the general rule for states which have developed a choice of law rule that deals with workers' compensation subrogation. Again, as I mentioned, and I'm sorry I, I, because I know it's complicated, but there are some states which haven't yet evolved to the point of developing a workers' compensation subrogation choice of law rule. They are following a choice of law rule that will be used even in a slip and fall where in a store where your employee, the injured party isn't working. A general tort action can still involve multiple states. If I'm on vacation down in Texas and I slip and fall and I'm not working and I slip and fall in a wine garden's grocery store, um, I can bring suit down in Texas, and the question is to which state governs uh, my rights as a plaintiff in the tort action. Can I recover punitive damages, et cetera, et cetera? Those things are governed by choice of law rules that have nothing to do with workers' compensation. So some states still haven't developed this body of law. And more and more states will as we become more active in handling our subrogation actions. Um, but the Larson rule is really the same as, uh, well, it's not the same as, but it's, it, it's derived from the restatement second, section 185. Restatement is, um, oh, it was a 17-year effort of a panel of judges and scholars. It's a three-volume treatise entitled Restatement of the Law, Second, Conflicts of Laws, and there's an appendix. And it analyzes and explains topics relating to differences between laws in cases um, where you have more than one state. And there are many different sections, uh, many of which deal with cases that don't involve workers' compensation. But Section 185 says, the local law of the state under whose workmen's compensation, that uh, should be workers, uh, it, it actually that, it reads workmen's in Section 185, but they need to change that. Uh, workers' comp compensation attached to an employee has received an award for an injury determines what interest the person who paid the award, that's you, 
has in any recovery for tort or wrongful death that the employee may obtain against a third party on account of the same injury. But you see the difference here? The Larson rule says we're going to apply the subrogation law of the state in which, and, and, and the substantive law of the state in which uh, benefits were paid, whereas Restatement 185, look at the words carefully. Um, the law, local law of the state under whose work, workers' compensation statute and employees receives an award for injury determines what interest the person who paid the award has in any recovery. So this restatement, for those states which apply it, will govern what right you as the work comp carrier have to a pool of money that's been recovered. But notice what it doesn't do. It doesn't determine or say which state governs when you can file. As the subrogated carrier, can you file five days after the accident, or do you have to wait a year? Do you have to give notice? You know, and every state is different. All you have to do is look at our book, Workers' Compensation Subrogation, in all 50 states, and look at how thick it is to know that every state is vastly different, and they govern and, and, and rule on things differently. Um, can you sue a co-employee? Can you sue in a medical malpractice case? Can you sue, sue in an uninsured motorist case? All of those variables we discussed aren't governed by Restatement 185 because it determines only what interest you have in the award. It doesn't say who can be sued, when you can sue, and other, other substantive rights. So the Larson rule is more global, and the Restatement 185, although favorable in, uh, in allowing the state which benefits you know, were paid under to determine the subrogation law rights, uh, it, it only, only deals with the interest we have. So now that you are familiar with the concept of choice of law, let's look at the actual procedure we should mentally go through when we have a conflict of law situation. Number one, these are four things we must determine or do in every case involving multiple states in order to maximize our segregation potential. Remember, each of these four steps, as we will now go through, are um, some examples of conflict of law situations. And we will use each step to evaluate the case and give us the foresight we are looking for. We're going to go through some actual examples, but bring out your yellow pad. You should have all the variables written down with regard to hiring and, and, and contacts and significant contacts and relationship, remember? Then you're going to draw a line. You're going to have all the variables that are different between Texas and Georgia, say, uh, that will affect your subrogation rights. And now you're going to draw a line, and now you're going to determine the variables or the factors that are involved. That's number one, remember? Number two, determine the subrogation laws of both states. Now you're going to draw a line. You're going to ask yourself, is there a conflict? If Texas law and Kentucky law are involved, you might look at those and say, well, you know what? It doesn't matter which state is involved. I still get my recovery. In that case, there is no conflict. So you can just throw the piece of paper away because there's no choice of law to be made. It doesn't matter. Your foresight won't give you any advantage because there's no difference between these two states. But oftentimes, there is a difference. There is a conflict. And when there's a conflict, that's when you have to apply the conflict rule or the choice of law rule of the forum state where the suit is, uh, is filed. Let's go through example one. When evaluating choice of law cases, I always take out that clean sheet of paper and I write these down. Determine the variables. All right, in our example, the employee is injured in a car accident in Georgia. Third party has minimum limits. Employer is based in Wisconsin. Employee resides in Wisconsin. Benefits paid under Wisconsin. Suit filed in Georgia. Employee hires Atlanta lawyer, settles case, claims he's not made whole. Now what? We've just gone through step one. We've determined the variables. Um, let's, let's look at step two. Determine the subrogation law of both states. Hmm. All right, both states allow for subrogation. So far, so good. Wisconsin subrogation law allows recovery if you're not made whole. Georgia's subrogation law requires the claimant to be made whole. In fact, it codifies it in its statute. Georgia law um, um, requires the claimant to be made whole and requires the carrier to prove that the claimant is made whole. All right, those are some rather significant issues. There may be other issues, depending on your facts. For example, if there's medical negligence involved, you'll want to add more uh, evaluation to this to step number two. You'll want to ask, how does Wisconsin law treat medical malpractice uh, as a third party versus Georgia? Because that may be the issue that's key for you. 
But let's move on in example number one to step three. Now, is there a conflict? Well, under Wisconsin law, under the facts we've just outlined, the carrier makes a partial recovery. Partial because uh, under 102.29 in the Wisconsin statute, we follow a formula and looks like you'll make a partial recovery. Under Georgia law, the carrier recovers nothing. So the conclusion here, given in example one, is, yeah, there are different outcomes. There is definitely a conflict. So now that there's a conflict, now for the first time we look at the choice of law rules to apply. And of course the rule is, and this is always the rule, you, the state where the suit is filed, you look at their laws to determine the choice of law rules. So again, you're going to look at their laws, the suit where the state is filed, to determine which state's law governs subrogation. Georgia conflict of law rule, we don't care about Wisconsin now. They're out as far as number four is concerned because the suit was filed in Georgia. Georgia law is lex loci delicti, which of course means the law of the place of the wrong. Because the tort applied in Georgia, we're going to apply the law of Georgia to our subrogation rights and the outcome is no recovery. So now if you went through this mental exercise in example number one before um, any subrogation issues came up, you could use hindsight to help steer this toward Wisconsin benefits if you have that choice. Um, so that's example number one. Let's go to another example. Again, step one, determine the variables and the facts. Employee dies in a plane crash in Oregon. All right. Number two, employer is based in Connecticut. The employee resides in Connecticut. The benefits are paid under the Connecticut Act. But the suit is filed in Oregon. There's our basic variables. Step two, determine the subrogation law of both states. Do we care? Is there a conflict? Um, does it matter to us? Both Connecticut and Oregon allow workers' compensation and they allow an intervention into the third-party action. So far, it doesn't matter to us. Next, Oregon allows subrogation in products cases. Okay, so far, so good. Number three, Connecticut, and, and this, this law changed in 1993, but if you have an old accident, Let's say Connecticut doesn't allow subrogation in products cases like it didn't at one point. Well, that's huge because that's what you have here is a products case. So if Connecticut, under their Product Liability Act, doesn't allow products liability subrogation, which at one point they didn't, they do now, um, then you have to look at is there a conflict? Under Connecticut law, there is no recovery for the carrier in this product's action. Under Oregon law, the carrier makes a full recovery. That's a huge difference. Depending on how many commas you have in your lien and your, your reserves, if it's a catastrophic loss, going through this mental exercise early, giving yourself that foresight makes a huge difference. But now we know that there is a conflict. So now that there is a conflict, let's look at and go to step number four. We'll apply the choice of law rule, the conflict of law rule of the forum state, which is which state? Well, it's Oregon, because that's where the suit is filed. So again, we don't care about Connecticut. We look at Oregon's choice of law rule. Their law, their rule is most significant contacts. And when you see most significant contacts, that should ring a bell that, okay, there's going to be a whole variety of criteria that you're going to have to look at to determine uh, who has the most significant contacts. Um, those, those rules are all set forth in the individual chapter, in this case the Oregon chapter of our, uh, our book, Workers' Compensation Subrogation in All 50 States, uh, and it will tell you what those are. So you, you'll be able to look at those, those criteria and make an educated guess. You won't know for sure because, again, this is subjective, and a judge will ultimately, ultimately make this decision, although there, there is precedent. If there's precedent given, we'll set that forth in the book as well. But the Oregon court will probably um, apply Oregon subrogation law, although, again, it's not always very clear cut. Let's go to a third example. In this case, an employee slips and falls at work in Illinois. And um, the employee's work-related injury is worsened due to medical malpractice, over-treating of medication, becomes addicted, uh, nicks um, uh, the spinal nerve during surgery, um, uh, whatever it might be. Dur medical malpractice um, is, it occurs in Illinois while being treated, but the employer is based in Iowa, the employer resides in Iowa, and Iowa benefits are being paid. 
And again, suits filed in Cook County, Illinois. And now we have to evaluate these fa variables and factors. We've identified them. So now let's go to step two and uh, determine the subrogation laws of both states. In some cases, both states may allow for subrogation, but one might require the payment of attorney's fees and not the others. One might allow a third-party action against a subcontractor, UN carrier. You know, we've talked about that. But in this case, obviously, malpractice is the big focus. So we have two variables. Illinois law allows for subrogation recovery in medical negligence cases. Iowa does not. Is there a conflict? Well, under Iowa law, the carrier cannot recover. Under Illinois law, the carrier can recover. Conclusion? Yeah, there is a diff different outcomes depending on which state's subrogation law applies. So there is a conflict. If there is a conflict, we then move on to rule number four. And we, all, we look to what state? the rules of the forum state to determine the choice of law rules. In this case, Illinois is where suits filed. The Illinois conflict rule is our good friend, the Larson rule. Professor Larson's rule has been applied. It means you apply the subrogation law of the state paying the benefits. Guess what? Larson didn't work so well for us in this case because we have to apply Iowa subrogation law. And under Iowa law, the carrier cannot subrogate against the medical malpractice recovery. How does that help us? Well, because if we've done this exercise before we started paying uh, Illinois benefits, we might have chosen Iowa benefits. Now, that, doesn't, that, that may not always help us, because in this case, um, having Iowa benefits paid um, may just lead to the same result. But perhaps if we are allowed under Iowa law to file suit before the claimant, and we're aggressive in subrogation, as I've always preached we should be, you might file suit first, and I've done this in a number of cases. And if you file suit first, you can choose the forum state uh, that, that should be applied. So if you file suit in Iowa and benefits are paid under Illinois, you have the opposite result here. So these are some examples of uh, and, and what we should go through. But when you get into competing interests between states, uh, you necessarily involve the United States Constitution. Uh, this is a very complicated uh, issue, and I'm just going to touch on it so you know it's there. It's called full faith and credit under Article 4 of Section 1 of our U.S. Constitution. It says, full faith and credit shall be given in each state to the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state. Um, you know, boy, that sounds a little weird. That's like the uh, outdated law that used to be here in Wisconsin for many years that said when you come to an intersection as a, as a driver of an automobile, um, an uncontrolled intersection. Um, each driver shall uh, come to a stop, and neither shall proceed until the other has gone. I mean, there literally was a statute that said that. It made no sense because everybody would just be parked. But um, the full faith and credit attempts to give full faith and credit to each state. And um, um, the United States has held that where the policy of one state statute comes into conflict with that of another, the necessity of some accommodation of the conflicting interest of the two is apparent. So really, what full faith and credit is, is it's just a safeguard against state abuses. And we've used full faith and credit to combat um, Georgia law and combat the laws of some other states that are trying to do what Georgia has done. And um, I'll, I'll talk about that in, uh, in just, well, it, it, Georgia has a, a concept in, called uh, payable under this chapter. And essentially what that means is Georgia is one of two states that says, because our statute says when benefits are payable under this act and the third party is liable, the employee may proceed against the third party and the workers' compensation carrier has the right to recover a lien or something to that effect. Well, they've taken the words payable under this chapter to literally mean um, it has to be paid under Georgia law or no subrogation is given. And there's a case called Johnson versus Comcar, Georgia Court of Appeals case, which held that way. Well, we've been able to fight similar uh, actions by trial lawyers because they all feed on this stuff. Uh, when, when in other states, we've been able to argue that it's a violation of full faith and credit when that's done. So uh, this exercise is should be able to give you some of the um, uh, the foresight that you're going to need to maximize your subrogation recovery. Because I cannot tell you how many files I see where this a little forethought was put into some of this stuff, when the claim first came in, um, it could have meant the difference between millions of dollars and none at all.
in, in subrogation recovery. So some tips for subrogating across state lines. Always familiar, familiarize yourself with both states' subrogation laws. It's hard to find a resource for this. I, I say this every time I talk about our book. I don't peddle books. We don't like to make a lot of money on books. But I want you to have the book because it's a great resource. Workers' Compensation Subrogation in all 50 states. It's found on our website or on the website of our New York publisher, Juris Publishing. Uh, you can just Google it. Google Workers' Compensation to my last name, and it'll come up. Uh, but it, it has the state subrogation laws in all 50 states, all of these variables. Understand the commission. Understand this process for approval of third-party settlements. Um, know the procedure for properly claiming your credit. A whole other issue in the subject of a whole other hour-long uh, webinar. Um, because depending on what you're required to do, you may choose one state over the other based just on that. Document everything with the trial court and the commission. And there are borrowing statutes to be concerned about when you're uh, dealing with uh, multiple states. And that simply means that one state may borrow the statute of limitations of another state under cer certain circumstances. So that's something to be considered when you are, have multiple states and one state has a one-year statute of limitations and the other state has a four-year, you may not have any choice as to where your third-party action is filed. So um, our time is at an end. I, I see we do have a number of questions that uh, Jamie has brought in a couple. Uh, and I'll try to get to these uh, real quickly here. Um, if you have emailed a question and we don't get to it, uh, as I said, our guarantee here is that we will get to it and get you an answer today, uh, I do need to announce our next webinar <clears throat> is going to be huge. Um, Tim Mankowski from our offices, who has done a treatise on uh, Fair Debt Collection Practices uh, Act and how it applies to subrogation across all lines, is going to be doing a huge webinar in July. Um, we don't have the date yet. It'll certainly be in our newsletter. If you need the newsletter, contact Jamie. She'll put you on, uh, on the mailing list. Connie in Fort Lauderdale, um, let me pull it up here, uh, has the following question. I've been told that Georgia only allows subrogation when the benefits are paid under the Georgia statute. Is that true? Um, yeah, I, I talked just, I started talking about this just briefly, the payable under this chapter issue, the Georgia, I'm sorry, the Johnson versus Comcar case. Um, the Georgia law does say that because their statute reads, quote unquote, when the injury or death for which compensation is payable under this chapter is caused under circumstances creating a legal liability against some person other than, than the employer, close quote, they take that words payable under this chapter literally to mean that only when Georgia benefits are paid will you have subrogation rights in a third party case filed in Georgia. This is why if you have any, any third party cases in Georgia, any accidents in Georgia, um, uh, and you're looking to maybe uh, pay benefits under the law of another state like Texas or uh, Florida, don't. Um, even though Georgia is a horrible state, you want to apply Georgia benefits because only if Georgia benefits are paid will you have any subrogation rights in the third party case in Georgia. Now, how ridiculous is that? Um, this, you know, the legislature, and I, and I ran for the legislature here in Wisconsin, um, uh, the, the, um, in, in the last election because they only had two lawyers out of 99 assemblymen. And uh, you know the, some of the stuff they were passing as laws were just horrible. Uh, these are not lawyers creating these laws. And when they write payable under this chapter, they're not even thinking about the potential for multi-state extraterritorial issues like we've just discussed for an hour. So um, it's a bad decision, and it's bad precedent. Other states like Connecticut have tried to follow through, and um, that's the, the only other state where, um, where that sort of issue arises. But yes, Connie, you're right. Uh, that is an issue in Georgia. Uh, Andrea, Andrea, I apologize if I mispronounce it, in Dallas, asks, does Tennessee only allow subrogation when benefits are paid under the Tennessee statute? OK, that's the exact same issue um, as we just talked about. Um, and uh, because the, the Tennessee statute does say the same thing. It's, it's, a lot of these statutes are copied and cut and pasted from other statutes. And it does say, when the injury or death for which compensation is payable, let me look at it here, under this chapter was caused under circumstances creating a legal liability in some third person. So it has the payable under this chapter language. However, the Tennessee Court of Appeals has looked at that. And they use common sense, unlike the Georgia Court of Appeals. 
They said in using the word payable, the legislature didn't intend to bar the workers' compensation carrier from, from pursuing subrogation in cases only where benefits were paid under the Tennessee statute. Um, that case is LaCroix versus uh, L.W. Matisson, Inc. Uh, it's a 2012 decision, uh, Tennessee app. Um, if you need the site, uh, let me know, or you can Google it. LaCroix, just like uh, the water, L.A. capital C-R-O-I-X versus L.W. Matisson is the case. So, that, uh, so the answer is no. Tennessee allows subrogation even when uh, they're paid under the Tennessee statute. Uh, let me see, let me see, JV just handed me something. Robert in Chicago asks, how does Alabama treat subrogation cases where benefits were paid under another state's workers' compensation subrogation? Okay, well, I, you know, that's the, you could pick any two states, and I'd ask you to go through the four uh, steps that we've discussed in the webinar, but Alabama is like a good number of states. It has an overarching conflict of law rule regarding tort cases that it applies to everything, including workers' compensation subrogation. And of course, that rule is the antiquated. It's one of the 12 we talked about that has stuck with lex loci delicti. It has not developed a choice of law rule involving workers' compensation. So with lex loci delicti, if suit is filed in Alabama, it's going to apply Alabama law. If suit is filed in some other state, it's, it's going to apply, or if the, 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 the action, the, the tort happens in, say, California, but the suit is in Alabama, Alabama will apply California law. Lex loci delicti, they're going to apply the law of the place of the tort. Um, because uh, Alabama, like other states, just, just says that um, workers' compensation is substantive rather than procedural. Uh, for procedural matters, Alabama will apply Lex Fori, which if you recall is the law of the forum. So it would always apply Alabama law to any procedural issues. Um, next, Robert in Chicago. Hey, it's a twofer. Robert, you asked, next question, is my understanding that Arkansas has developed a unique approach to resolving conflict of law situations? Is, is this correct? Um, uh, the answer is yes and no. They have developed a choice of law test that is different from simply the most significant contacts, lex loci delicti, or the Larson rule, or the restatement. They have a, developed a hybrid. Um, lex loci delicti has fallen into disfavor in Arkansas and is giving way to something they call uh, five choice influencing factors. They look at five factors to determine which state's law will govern subrogation. And these factors include uh, predictability of results, maintenance of interstate and international order, simplification of the ju judicial task, advancement of the forum's governmental interests, and application of the better rule of law. So again, it's really just a license for them to lick their finger and put it in the, into the wind and say, well, today we're going to say that Louisiana law applies. Um, so, so in some of these states, as I said, it's not always black and white. You can't email me or your, you know, any other lawyer and say, hey, which, under these facts, which uh, state's laws apply. But um, in in um, Arkansas, the uh, court of I'm sorry, the Arkansas Supreme Court in uh, 2005 or six, there was a Supreme Court decision in which an employee of a Target store in Louisiana was injured when a load shifted on a, on a truck. And uh, the truck had been loaded in Arkansas, which is where the principal place of business was. But benefits were paid under Louisiana's law. And the court ultimately held, after looking at these five choice influencing factors, uh, they determined that uh, Arkansas law had the better rule of law and more significant contacts and applied Arkansas law. So in these states, like Arkansas, they don't have uh, a developed rule, choice of law rule for workers' compensation. So they apply this overarching rule that uh, governs all issues of law, not just subrogation. And they held that um, Arkansas had the uh, better rule of law, more significant context, even though benefits were paid under Louisiana law. OK, I have some other questions here. Um, when do we need to get uh, Pam from Sedgwick? Uh, um, asks, when do we need to get an attorney involved in extraterritorial subrogation if the claimant doesn't have an attorney? Well, the fact that the claimant doesn't have an attorney, uh, Pam, buys you some additional time. Um, you, 
obviously, I, hopefully, if I've done my job right today, you, you, you see how and why uh, developing foresight on these cases is, is just infinitesimally important and, and profitable for you as, as, as a subrogated carrier. And you should Im immediately be making these determinations. You don't necessarily need me or any subrogation lawyer um, or any lawyer uh, unless you want to get an opinion as to where you can file suit. Hopefully you'll go through these exercises, you'll determine, let's say you're looking at Minnesota and Idaho, and you say, wow, under Minnesota I've got an issue because they can settle short. They can do a Lambertson um, contribution claim, they can um, settle, uh, uh, do a nag or you know a settlement around me. I don't want that. I want to be in Idaho where things are cleaner. Uh, you could ask counsel, can I file for benefits in, in Idaho. And that may be a good move for you. And again, you're applying foresight to avoid a undesirable result later on down the road. You're using your head, using the insights you have, and what foresight you can gain. Now, the, the longer you wait, um, the less advantage this foresight will have. Because if the, if the benefits are paid under a state, if that choice is made long before the subrogation issues are resolved, well, then you, you sort of are just going to be in the hands of fate. Um, but arguing um, the application of a, another state's subrogation laws is still a tool that's available to you, even if you don't get involved um, uh, early on. Um, so I, you know, generally, it's it's I, there's no golden rule that I can give you. It really does depend on the states and the issues and the amount involved. But again, if you have any questions, um, our new website, by the way, and it's brand new and it has all the subrogation resources on there, including subrogation questions and charts and a map that you can click on the state and up will pop a lot of this law. So it's a good place for you to start for resources. But you can click and contact us and just give us the facts and we can help you through that. Maybe you don't have to get an attorney involved right up front. Um, although maybe it is worthwhile if there are subrogation issues, investigation, and things like that, but that's a whole other subject. So I have a couple other, well, I, more than a couple, looks like questions, but I am going to um, uh, go ahead and answer those, uh, and I'll have other folks help answer those um, via email. I do appreciate your attending. We thank you for attending today, and uh, hopefully you'll look forward to the upcoming webinar on the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act and how it applies to subrogation across all lines. God bless. Thank you for attending. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.